Hi, welcome back. For those of you who haven't watched the first video, my name is Becky. I am one of the science development managers for STEM scopes. Okay. Um, I already had a video on carrying capacity. It is called the hook, which is our very basic intro to the idea. This is going to be the next step. So this is called an explore where we're going to get more into the data and make connections to the real world. For this activity, all you need is a handout. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that you see what I am talking about. Okay. So your handout is um, available to print. You can also download, download this and, and write on the copy directly if you want to do it that way. Now, we are fully aware that um, the internet right now is being used by a whole lot of people. You may not have the devices available in your house right now to manipulate this data set. So I'm gonna actually do the manipulation for you. That way you can just watch the video uh, and complete the handout and still get the overall gist of this activity. Okay. So we're gonna start, I'm gonna read this, it's called hair and links populations. Every population has a carrying capacity in its environment. The factors considered when measuring the carrying capacity include the boundaries in which the organisms live, the resources that the organisms compete for, the climate, and the competition found within that ecosystem. These are all limiting factors that will impact the number of organisms that can be supported. Before beginning this activity, please be aware that you will be using real world data. Real world data is not neat and clean. In reality, population numbers constantly fluctuate, increasing and decreasing above and below the carrying capacity line. When asked to draw a line for the carrying capacity of an organism, you should draw a line that is approximately in the middle of the highs and lows for that population. All right, so now I'm gonna follow these directions exactly over here. So the snowshoe hair population study, I'm gonna start by manipulating the year, all right? Our data goes all the way back to 1845, but we just want to look at from 1900 moving forward. Um, that's just going to clean up the data a little bit. Okay. Along our x-axis, that's the dependent variable. So that's going to be where, excuse me, independent variable, that's going to be where the year goes. Our dependent variable goes along the y-axis. So we're going to start with the hair. Now I'm gonna make a line graph out of this data. This is what we mean by not pretty numbers. Um, it's very common in school to give, when we want to show relationships, that they end up being pretty clear, just straight lines. Um, that's not the case here, but it's important to note that this is still absolutely a line graph. It's just recording actual numbers okay, um, of different populations. Okay, so at this point, go ahead and pause the video and draw this graph. All right, now that you've drawn your graph, before we move on, I want you to consider a couple things at the graph that you drew. One, are your axes labeled? Okay. It's really important to get into the habit. Uh, it's a good science and engineering practice to constantly label those axes so that other scientists know what you're talking about. Okay. Second, did you intentionally space out your numbers? Okay. Are your units labeled? All these things are good anytime you're drawing your graph. Okay. Now it's your turn, to your turn to determine the carrying capacity for the hair. So you wanna draw a horizontal line somewhere in your graph. Pause now to do that. Okay. So where did you draw that carrying capacity line. Ideally, you should have had it somewhere between 45,000 and 60,000, okay? right about in here. If you did not successfully estimate that, okay, remember that the population size increases when the population is below the carrying capacity. So, Right here, this is drops and you start to see it go up. So we know that's kind of gonna be the bottom. Okay. And similarly, the carrying capacity 
is going to decrease anytime it's more than. Okay. So again, if 60 is kind of our max. Anytime they spiked above, there was almost an immediate downturn. All right. Now we're going to move to the links. So I'm going to X out the hair and replace it now with the links. Everything else stays the same. You're going to record your graph, making sure to look at your units, to look at your labels, all of that. Pause the video to take care of your graph. Once again, determine that carrying capacity. At this point, we would expect the carrying capacity to be around 25,000 to say 35,000. What's important to note on your graph is that again, the middle here is not the same middle as the hair, and that's because of your units. We're only counting by 10,000s when the links are involved. On the hair, it was 20,000. That's why it's really important to always double check these axes. Okay. Moving on to question five. The shape of the population line tells us the story of what is happening to the number of individuals over time. This graph can take the form of many different shapes, each of which tells us a story. Look at your graph and see if you can describe the story it is telling. For the range of years listed below, provide a possible explanation to describe what is happening to the population of your species. So for each of these 10 year increments, make sure to describe what's physically happening on the graph, as well as a possible explanation. Predict why you think that happened. Pause the video now so you can get that done. All right, so from 1900 to 1910, I'd start with what the number is. So I'd say roughly 18,000 um, links were in Canada. There was a downturn that first year and then almost an immediate huge growth. I would say that growth, I would predict probably that it had to do with their food source. So I'm, I would think that the hair um, probably had increased, which then allowed them. Okay. But before 1910 closed, there was this huge correction where there was a downturn. So after a year or two of huge growth, then the next year, almost half of those links died off probably due to what their food source being gone would be a, a very valid explanation. Right. That's what you should go through all of the A, B, C, and D. Okay. We're now going to put the hair count. We're going to add that to this. Okay. Now you can see that the hair is in red and that the links is, uh, population is in purple. Pause now to draw both graphs. Um, if you have two different colors, that's great to color code it. If you don't, just with your pen or pencil, you can draw, say, triangles for one, circles for the other. That way you can, um, or maybe dot a line versus a solid line, just so you can see that they're two different graphs. Moving on to question seven. With both populations on your graph, what similarities and differences do you see? Okay. I'd start with both graphs. A similarity is that they both seem to fluctuate. Seems very cyclical that after there's a high point, there seems to be a down point, high point, down point. Okay. Um, differences are that the graph peaks and valleys do not align. So when the hair was high, the links were low, okay? And vice versa, when the links were at their high point, very similarly, the hair was at a low point. I would also note that the amount, <coughs> excuse me, that the um, number of 
the populations also varied quite a bit. So the highest point the hare reached is almost 100,000, whereas the highest point the lynx reached was only, say, 45,000 at any point. At what point did the populations for both organisms appear to be the same? Say right around here, 1905. Looking back at your predictions from before, now I want you to add some thoughts. So before question five was just talking about why would that lynx population have varied? Now you have some more data, right? Now you have the hair. So go back and factor in how that other population impacted or caused a change in the, the lynx count. Pause and then when you're ready, come back. Moving to question 10, this graph shows the predator-prey relationship between these two populations. You're going to describe and explain the pattern between the lynx, the predator, and the prey. Pause now, and then we'll discuss. All right. So one thing we want you to see is that the lynx population increases when the hare population increases it decreases when the hair population decreases as well. So they do seem to have pretty um, positive relationships with each other. It doesn't happen the exact same year. That's important to note that it seems that the hair goes a year or so before, and then a year or so later, the lynx population follows suit. Question 11, if the lynx were removed from the environment, what would happen to the population of the hare? What would you expect to happen to the carrying capacity of the hare? Go ahead, answer 11 and 12, so that we're not pausing between both, and then we'll come back and wrap it up. Okay. So if you removed the, the lynx population, it would make sense to predict that the hair population would increase significantly. Right? We have data to support that claim. Every time the links were really low, there was a huge growth in hair. So that part I don't think is, is very surprising. The carrying capacity question is where it becomes a little more interesting. A lot of times, again, we teach a, a simplification of, of these biological concepts where students want to think that the carrying capacity is a set number. It's actually not. So it, as a whole, can even raise and lower. By taking out a predator, this entire carrying capacity would actually increase as well. So instead of being here, it may actually raise a little bit. There is st still, though, important to note a max. At some point, regardless, the ecosystem will make, will make a reach equilibrium and a new carrying capacity for that population will be established. Okay, 12. In this activity, you observed and analyzed the relationship between the hare and lynx populations in Canada. Would you expect to see similar relationships between the hare and lynx populations in all of North America? And explain. Okay. Um, from here, it's more, we wanted you to think about data in the real world. So this is a pretty good, solid real world example, but it's still just one area, one ecosystem. So scientists wanna be very careful when they report things to not make generalizations beyond what their data says. Okay. So instead of saying, absolutely, there's, this is gonna be the same thing, you really want to make sure to include wording that says the trends predict that or something along the lines of because it happened here, there's a high probability that it would if this, this, and this stayed true. Okay? So you really want to back and um, provide explanation to that. Okay. Um, that is it for this lesson. I hope you learned a little bit more about carrying capacity and about why data 
though not pretty data, still gives us some really good results. Um, continue to check back and we hope to keep posting videos to teach you things. Um, and thanks for checking this out. All right, bye.